Good morning, I'm Peggy. Today's scripture is 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. <clears throat> he waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, Bring the burnt offerings here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offerings. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offerings, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered up Michmash, I said, now the, Phil the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God, for which he commanded you. And then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. This is the word of our Lord. You can sit down. A good morning. Every Sunday when I stand before you, I always let you know, and I hope you don't get tired of me saying this, but James chapter 3 verses 1 says to me and every other person that occupies this space in a service behind a pulpit that we will be judged more harshly and more strictly. When I pray and I write and I think and I pray and I hope and I study that I deliver the Word of God appropriately, whether it's challenging to you or uncomfortable for you, I make sure that verse is in the back of my mind because God says what I'm going to do here in the next 25 to 30 minutes, I will be judged more strictly for. I am an over shepherd of, of, uh, a shepherd over you all. And my job is to not to make you comfortable or happy. My job is to preach the, God, the, the, the Word of God faithfully, and it lands where it lands in your ears, whether it's an encouragement or a challenge. Uh, so I will always continue to go with that. I want you to know that we are in such a wonderful congregation of people. Um, I just want to point that out. Yesterday uh, morning, I came expecting, we were supposed to come and help clean this, the school, help paint and do different things. I was expecting, I had really low expectations to be honest with you, I was expecting maybe five or ten people to show up to help us do this. We had 45 people take, yeah, take their Saturday morning to come in, WD-40, these chairs, paint railings. Uh, paint classrooms, get to know teachers, scrape paint off of the windows. My scraping team, where y'all at? <laughs> <laughs> scraping paint off of windows, let me tell you something. Our hands are tender this morning. And I want to say thank you. Um, that's part of serving our city, part of serving the community, part of serving this school that we don't just meet at, but we partner with in so many different ways. Um, I'm grateful for you all. And many of you are serving in other ways, whether you're RC leaders volunteering in kids' ministries. Whenever we, we sound a bell and we ask for people to volunteer, you show up. So God bless you and thank you very much. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray that as we sit, may the words that you have placed in my heart come out and may it find its way to the ears and the hearts and the minds of those who are seated. I pray that we are able to sit and concentrate for the next 25 to 30 minutes and hear your word and have it change us 
just a little bit more. Heavenly Father, I pray that someone's going to hear your word for the first time in their life. Will you make that very clear? Will you work through me this morning? I want to thank you. We honor you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. For the past few weeks, we've been in a, in a, in a series. Sorry, ushers, I forgot. If you need a Bible um, in Spanish or English, the ushers have them. So if you just raise your hand, we'll be glad to get you a Bible. That is a gift from us to you so you can follow along in this service. So if you need one physical Bible, just raise your hand. Chris will be glad to give you one. Um, thank you, Carissa, for doing that. Appreciate you, ushers. The past uh, five weeks or so, maybe three weeks or so, we have been looking at the life of King Saul. We've also been looking at the, the historical portion where the people of Israel are needing and wanting a king that is physical, that is a human being. And as the story has unraveled, I hope you are able to follow along and keep up with what is actually going on. The, the Old Testament of the Bible was written in the Hebrew language. I mean, with the, exception of, with the exception of Ezra and a portion of Daniel, which is in Aramaic, Hebrew is the predominant language of the Old Testament. And Hebrew is a more poetic language. It, the way the writers wrote the Old Testament was so that when you read it, when we read it, or anyone who read it would help us not only understand what's happening, but the culture within which that story is occurring, right? The Hebrew language, like I said, is incredibly poetic. It shows up in ways that we least expect it. It, it actually helps us as we read to discover, not to go from point to point to point like we do in Western stories. Western stories are kind of linear and they go kind of, you go from one point to another. If you read the Old Testament, some of it is chronological, but a lot of it you have to unravel. The stories tend to be circular. Um, if you read Genesis 1 and 2, you will see that very clearly how the authors are unraveling it. They're trying to get you not facts, but kind of the why. And, and, and kind of how you can see the character of God to discover what is happening as opposed to kind of a general, general chronological story. The Hebrew writers in, in the book of 1 Samuel is inviting us into a discovery, right? Where whenever, whenever a character is introduced in the Old Testament, I want you, as you read from now on, I want you to think about the first action or the first words that someone says in the Old Testament whether it's Noah or Abraham or Joseph, the first words of the first actions of somebody actually sets the course of that person's trajectory in the Bible. You can see, you can, you can pick up something from, from that first action or first um, words, what that person is actually going to be about. Saul is introduced to us in chapter 9 of 1 Samuel. And one of the first things that is said about him is his physical appearance right? And his wealth. So it tells you something about Saul as we begin to go. Saul is the king of Israel, and his life, I think, is one that we can learn from. We can study him, and through him, we can learn a lot about leadership. We can learn about God's character. We can learn about God's sovereignty. And God wanted, God wanted his people to see him through their history, Samuel is chosen by God. He is anointed by the priest. And by all accounts, he's in great position to succeed as king. But Samuel, I'm sorry, Saul, actually has a lot of character frauds that we don't quite see as we open up. Anybody here buy a house recently? You bought a house, raise your hand. If you've been shopping for a house in your life, raise your hand. All right? If you know what I'm talking about, you, sometimes when you go see a house, when you, when you walk into a house, this is my experience, and maybe this is, maybe this is not your experience, when you, go, when you walk into a house and the owner or the person who's selling the house wants to make the house look more attractive, they throw a, first, a fresh coat of paint on there, right? They paint over stuff. So when you walk in, you're like, oh, this is, this is great, right? But sometimes in that, underneath that paint, 
tells a different story. Anybody with me? Annie and I, when we were looking for our first house, we saw 40 houses, put in nine offers, the ninth offer before we finally got a house. And <laughs> I was so tired of looking, I was so tired of looking, the real estate agent called me at 8 a.m. that morning. He said, hey, Marcus, one came on the market. I think this is the one for you. I said, you know what? Go ahead, do it. Go ahead, put the offer in. <laughs> go ahead, do it. Because at this point, what have I got? This is Denver, right? I, I, what have I got to lose? Go ahead and do it. Well, 2 o'clock, he called me. He said, guess what? You got the house. <laughs> what did I get? <laughs> Let's go check this out. <laughs> what did I get? Oh right? We got a house. That night, I wanted to surprise Annie, so I got to the house. A few weeks later, I got to the house. I'm looking at it, and it does, it's not pretty. You know, so I, it's a jetted tub in the bathroom, old jetted tub. So I said, let me fill this thing, and let me clean this thing out, you know, so my wife can come in and see that I've done some work. I started filling up that tub, and all of a sudden, it was quiet in the house. I started to hear a drip. I started to hear more of a drip. I started to hear a, a flow, and it sounded like a river. Oh, Lord. I went down in the basement. Sure enough, that water was leaking right through right through the life fixtures. But we kept that house. <laughs> we weren't going back out there. What I'm trying to tell you is that this morning, I would like to be your real estate agent <laughs> and walk alongside of you so you can see the cracks that is behind the fresh coat of paint that is Saul's life. I'm trying to get you to see the electrical work, in a sense, that is done poorly. I'm trying to get you to see the foundation that has cracks in it. I'm trying to get you to see the land that is built on, that he was built on, that is on a floodplain perhaps. I'm trying to get you to see the cracks that are clearly present in Saul. And there are three things you can see in Saul's life. His impatience, his pride, and there's a big college word, his narcissism. Next week, we'll look at... Um, Verse 15, for chapter 15, which talks about obedience to God is better than a sacrifice. Pick me up in verse, uh, verse 8. This is Saul getting ready for battle, and he's waiting on the priest to come and bless the, the troops and send them off into battle. It says, Saul, referring, uh, he referring to Saul, he waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? Saul's about to go into battle here. The people are gathered, soldiers, people, are, they're, they're, ready for, they're ready to do what they usually do before a great battle, right? They're waiting for instructions from the Lord. They're waiting for the priest to bless them. But Saul have, has been commanded by, he has been commanded by Samuel not to go into battle because this is what God has told the priest. Do not let my people go into battle without offering a sacrifice to me. Don't do it. Saul's impatience said, we're going to go ahead and do it. Here's why this is significant. If you look back in the book of Leviticus, the burnt offering is the first and the one of the most significant offerings that the people of God could, could offer to God. The purpose of the burnt offering was to make an atonement for the sin, for the sin offerer, thus helping, helping them gain God's acceptance. The burnt offering was thus so much to gain, it was not so much to gain forgiveness for a particular sin, but to make up to have an atonement for the offerer's sinfulness. In a corporate setting, the priest would be the one to carry out the burnt offering for an atonement of sins. So by ignoring the priest, by ignoring God, by being impatient and carrying out the suffering, carrying out the offering, Saul has placed himself, I don't want you to miss this, in the seat of being a priest. Saul is not a priest. God has not appointed him to be a priest. He's terribly unsure. He's impatient. He's really wanting to get things done. There's so much fear and a lack of trust in God's plan and, and God's way of doing things that Saul says, let's go ahead and do it. God, you see, God had always been with the people of Israel. He had always carried them through, right? They're going into battle, and God says, this is how you do it. And Saul says, no, I can't wait because you guys are going to leave me. The Philistines are going to attack us. I need to do something. Saul couldn't wait for the Lord to fight his battles. Anybody in here been there? 
You can't wait for God to move on your behalf. I believe in dialogical preaching, so if you're quiet here this morning, I need you to speak up. You couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't in your life wait for God to fight your battle. You look to take your matters into your own hands. You attempted, sometimes, I'm, this is, I'm preaching to myself here, you attempted to advance God's plan before it was time. You know the regret that comes with that. One preacher says this, he says, the only thing harder than waiting on God is wishing that you had. It happens in our careers. It happens in relationships. It happens in finances. It happens. It has happened to me. We want a high-speed internet God. When God more like, I don't know what was before high speed. When I was in high school, you used to get that terrible noise. God is even slower than that when he's moving. But he's right on time. Amen? We want a microwave kind of God. We want a genie kind of God. When God really is, is a crockpot kind of God right? He doesn't work that way. He doesn't work on our timing. In the waiting, in our waiting for God, and I know some of you in here are waiting on God right now, in our waiting for God, God is doing something that we, can, we cannot understand. He's forming us. His formation, He's building our character. He's fixing those cracks in, in, in the land. He's fixing those cracks in the building, in your foundation, right? He's taking the long view, said, if you're going to live in this body, if you're going to live on this earth for these years, you need X, Y, and Z. God works slow. He works poetically. He's unraveling, in, he's unraveling your character so that it gets, He works very deliberately. Let me say this. This is obvious, but sometimes we need to be reminded, none of us in here and nobody in here can get up out of this seat right now and say, no, I'm done. I'm going to tomorrow. I'm just going to leave you all here, and today I'm going to go to tomorrow. We all can. No one can go to tomorrow. We all move in the same time. You understand? God lives in that way. God moves in that way. Some of you here right now, I know that's for a fact, are in a season of waiting. And it doesn't seem to make sense. It doesn't seem you're waiting for something. You've been waiting for years. You've been waiting for months. You've been waiting perhaps all your life, and it's not happening. You're in a crock pot, like I said, and man, that crock pot is getting hot. You think you're ready. You think now or never, Lord, but God is, God is, God is working. Your pride sometimes gets injured. I know sometimes when you're waiting, your pride gets injured because you expect to be further along in life than you are right now. You found yourself where you're never, you're, you're in a place where you never thought you would be, right? People are leaving your life. You want to go ahead and get going. So you want to do the sacrifice. You want to do all the things. You want to do it quickly. But I'm going to urge you this morning, don't move too fast because pride is expensive. If you move too fast, you will miss your blessing. Saul's pride, verse 17 says, Saul's pride, he's he's completely, he wants to control the priest. Pick me up in, in 17, I think it's 14, 17 here. Then Saul said to the people who were with him, count and see who has gone. The people are leaving Saul. And when they had counted, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer, Jonathan is Saul's son, we're not there. So Saul said to Ahijah, bring the ark of God here, for the ark of God went at that time with the people of Israel. Now Saul was talking to the priests, and the tumult in the camp of the Philistines increased more and more. So Saul said to the priests, withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and went into battle. Saul's unhinged. What, he, what, what, the, what, what we're trying to get to here is that the priest was supposed, again, this is the second time, was supposed to kind of pray for them to send them off into battle. But Saul can't wait. He said, my troops are leaving me, and I can hear the Philistine. These evil people are getting ready to fight, and we need to do something. The fear is there. The, you can just feel it in, 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 the, in the air. We're going to get killed if we don't move, and I can't wait for a priest to come and bless us for us to go. So go ahead and remove your hand. I'm going to keep going. Saul's saying, I know you're supposed to do this, God, but I can't wait for you. In the streets, 
when I was in high school, we used to hang out in the streets of um, suburban Washington, D.C. I remember when things got short and, <laughs> and we couldn't wait for something to happen. We wanted to make something happen. We used to say this phrase, ain't nobody got time for that. Saul is telling the priest for that. The priest is trying to pray. He's saying, hey, priest, ain't nobody got time for that. The battle's coming. I need to get going. But he's missing his blessing. He's missing his blessing. Pride, pride costs us God's best, folks. Pride costs us God's best. The difficult thing about pride in our lives is that it is intoxicating. It blinds us. It's difficult for us to see our own pride. It always, almost always takes someone else to point out that, hey, this is, a, this is an issue in your life that you need to look at, right? Someone has to confront us about it. Someone has to make it plain for us to see what we cannot see. You and I have pride. We want people to see us differently than we really are. The root sin, C.S. Lewis would argue, the root sin is that pride kind of is the, is the root of all our sin. It comes out of everywhere. We make choices that sometimes just delay God's blessing. I want to shout out, uh, not shout out, but one of the best books I've ever read in my, in my Christian formation, I used to read it every year, is a book called Mere Christianity. You might know that book. In chapter 8 of that book, C.S. Lewis talks about pride, right? And he says this about pride. He says, there is one vice to which no man in the world is free, which everyone in the world loathes when he sees it in someone else and which hardly any people except Christians ever imagine that they are guilty of themselves. I do not think I have ever heard anyone who was not a Christian accuse himself of this vice, and at the same time, I have very seldom met anyone who was not a Christian who showed the slightest mercy to it in others. I'll skip down a few. The vice uh, C.S. Lewis is talking about is pride. The Bible mentions pride so many times. It's almost as if we need to pick it up. God is saying, God opposes pride. All those verses you see, Psalm 138, Proverbs 3, Proverbs 29, Matthew 22, Luke, Luke 1, James 4, Peter 5, 1 Peter 5, all give the same refrain. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Pride, pride is going to cost Saul the kingdom. Pride is expensive. In verse 14, God looks at it, God exposes, the writer exposes uh, Saul's insecurity. I'll just, I'll just sum this up real quick. In verse 14, in chapter 14, verse 24, Saul is leading the troops into battle, and at some point they get to a point where they're, gonna, they're actually going to go fighting, but Saul says to them, he says, no one should eat until we get to this battle. He's, he's forcing He's forcing his troops to go without food. Right? He's, he's hoping that, he, he's thinking that the world revolves around me. They're not, they're not fasting. He didn't say we should fast for the battle. He said, and, and he says, no one should eat because I want to avenge my enemies. The battle is not about, in Saul's mind, it's not about God's people. It's not about God. It's not about the nation. It's about Saul. It's personal for him. And he's holding people hostage, his troops hostage, and saying, no one should eat. He's laying an oath as well. Saul's determined. He's determined to win this battle. He's telling his troops, you guys cannot eat. We're going to starve. That seems very counterintuitive. There's some people who are going into battle. Saul is completely out of his element. He's completely over his head. He's doing things like this because... The cracks in his foundation are beginning to reveal themselves. He's, what, I love this phrase that Americans use. They say, we're going to fake it till you make it, right? He's faking it till he makes it. He didn't hear from the Lord. God didn't tell him to starve his people. God didn't tell him to go on a fast. The priest didn't tell him. He's kind of on his own. He's making it up as he goes. He is completely blind. Saul is trying desperately to occupy a place and an office that he is not anointed to be in. He's not assigned to. He's not blessed with nothing. He's trying. There is, there is something about people who appear to be Christians but don't live like it. The gentleman who founded Redemption has a famous quote, and I love this quote. He said, one time he was, he, was, he was in a place, he was sitting with a guy, he was talking to a guy, and he asked the man a question. He said, hey, are you a Christian? Normal question. 
The guy said, yes, I'm a Christian, but not in the biblical sense. <laughs> Saul, is, he's almost like he's pretending to do godly things, but he really isn't connected to God. How can somebody be a Christian and not in the biblical sense? Saul is digging, is digging and digging. He's confused. He's afraid. He's impulsive. His character is completely unraveling. I'm starting to sweat here, Lord, but, and, you know, <laughs> when I was in Liberia and they asked me to speak, when I was speaking at this church in Liberia, <laughs> oh, my gosh, I started sweating. Everybody knew I wasn't from there, but I am from there. <laughs> I hope you're starting to see the cracks in the foundations of Saul. He's getting exposed and he's under pressure because Saul is not formed. He just has a fresh coat of paint. And under pressure, he's falling apart. The Philistines are near. Here's, here's, I, I want you to sometimes, because like I said two weeks ago, the Bible, the Old Testament gives us rounded characters. We see there's no clear villain or no clear, very few people are like clear heroes or clear villains. So, uh, Saul here is in, in, in a place that we can all see, we can all identify with at some points. He's not quite just completely a villain because we all have insecurities. We all get impatient with the Lord. We all do certain things. Here, here's what Saul's into. The Philistines are big, bad people. And the Philistines if you miss this, if you read this, you'll get this point. The Philistines were one of the first people to learn how to use metal in combat. So one of the first people to kind of wield their own swords and things like that, they had learned that from the Hittites. And they were teaching the Israelites to do just that. But once the war started, they said, we're not teaching you guys how to do this. So only Saul and Jonathan have weapons. All the other troops don't. And the Philistines have their weapons and they're coming. Can you sense Saul's angst right now, right? You can sense why he's getting impatient. He's like, why is he so impatient? Why don't he just wait for God? It feels like his life is on the line. If you only have, you have an army, only two people have weapons. Everybody else doesn't and the other crew does, right? And the priest is there. You're going to be like, priest, ain't nobody got time for this. <laughs> they have no weapons. Verse 8, I want to go back to verse 8, right? It says, he waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. Skip down with me to, verse, to, to, to Samuel's reaction. When Samuel says, in verse 11, Samuel says, what have you done? And Saul says, when I saw the people were scattering from me, and you did not come within the days you appointed, and that the Philistine had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel, said, and Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God, which is, which is, why he command, which is what he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. My question, and I hope this is the basis of where we're going this afternoon or this morning, is why does God deal so harshly with Saul? Why does Samuel the priest tell Saul, your kingdom will not continue? It seems as though, at least when you read it from a Western perspective, the punishment does not fit the crime. This guy offered a sacrifice, and all of a sudden he's losing his kingdom. The guy burns the sacrifice and he loses his entire kingdom. It seems to me, and the cursory reading, it may seem to you that God is harsh. God is unjust here, it seems. God is not fair. That's what it seems like. God removes Saul, ladies and gentlemen, because he's fearful, because he's narcissistic, he's impatient, he's prideful, he's insecure, and he's impulsive. All of those things point to not trusting God for anything in his life and wanting to take God's place above the people. 
the sacrifice he just offered, it's only, like I said, it's just, he just offered, it's only, should be only offered by the priest. The priest that is appointed by God should be the only one to offer the sacrifice. Saul is being rejected by God. Saul, in a sense, is rejecting God's authority over God's people. I want to lead your people my way. Saul is prideful in trying to combine, he's trying to combine the office of priest and king. The great American philosopher Dwayne Johnson said, are you smelling what I'm cooking? <laughs> Some of you guys got that. That's a form of life. Right? He's trying to combine the office of priest and king. Saul forgot that God has God chose him to care for his people. Saul's sinful behavior is actually putting the people of the Lord in danger. God cares for his people. And if he has a leader that isn't following him, he's going to remove that leader. He is making it clear that it will, he will find someone who will care for his people better. Saul's recklessness is reflecting on God's love for his people because the people will look at Saul and his erratic behavior and his impulsive behavior and said, if this is the God that God, if this is the guy that God chose, what kind of God is that? Are you following me? The qu- people will begin to question God's love for them because the king that he chose is not living up to expectations. In other words, God is definitely taking Saul out of the game. When I used to watch baseball when I was 13, 14 years old, I didn't understand it. Um, I, would, I, would sit, I was three months into this country, and I would sit and watch baseball, and I wanted to understand, but I didn't understand it. When, when the pitcher was, I thought it was good when the pitcher was, when people were hitting the ball. I thought that was good. Like, when, it's not good for the pitcher when people are hitting the ball, right? So the pitcher is just serving him up, and he's getting a hit. Well, maybe I'll get the next guy out. Maybe I'll get the next guy out. And I always found it interesting that when the manager would come out, when the pitcher was called, called in trouble, he used to go like this, right? Your time is done. Let's get somebody else in here. God is saying, hey, Saul, your time is done. You, you can't get another person out. God has seen enough. This should be a warning to all of us. Pride is expensive. Let me ask you this. Where do you find yourself in this story? We tend to see ourselves as kind of the good guy in the story, but at this point, it doesn't seem like there are any good guys. What do you see yourself in the story? I'll tell you where I find myself, and perhaps maybe you find yourself in the story, right? I find myself a sinful, chaotic, impatient, struggling to trust God person. I find myself as the impulsive human being who wants to do things before God wants them done. I find myself in a position where actions and my actions and attitude sometimes obscures how others see God. Amen? It seems sometimes that my actions make other people question God. If you're honest with yourself, sometimes you see that. A few weeks ago, actually two weeks ago, we have these redemption t-shirts that say, all of life is all for Jesus, right? You've seen those t-shirts around, you can get them. Uh, I'm not advertising t-shirts, but actually you should get them. Um, All of life is all for Jesus. So I put one of those t-shirts on, and I'm traveling. I'm getting on a plane. I'm, I'm going on, on a little bit of a vacation. So I, I, get, on, I get on the plane. I, I'm, in the, I'm in the airport. And let me just tell you something. If you're going to wear that T-shirt, <laughs> don't forget you're wearing it. <laughs> if you're going to wear all of life is off with Jesus T-shirt, don't forget you're wearing it. I'm in the TSA line. I need, I need to say more. I'm in the TSA line. We're going, and I'm getting, I'm getting sort of impatient because the guy is moving slow, and I'm a little bit late, and I got to catch my flight. My family's already there. I need to get there, and he's moving so slow, and I'm like, Lord, I started to get some kind of way. I'm starting to get some kind of way. He's talking to his family, and I'm thinking, ain't nobody got time for this. I'm, I, I got to get somewhere, right? And I get to the front of the line. You know what he says? Nice T-shirt. <laughs> Shots fired. I'm getting on the plane, same thing, right? I, you, know, you know that little, I don't know what they call it. I, I like to call it like a heat pack, Those, that ramp that you walk on to get onto the plane, right? In, in Phoenix, in the middle of the day, it's hot in, it's hot in there. You're just standing in there. You're, you're like, I might, they might as well season me right now and put some butter on me because I'm barbecue, right? 
and I, I, I'm, in, I'm impatient. I want to get on this plane. And we, we get on the plane. I'm sweating. I'm going to say something. And people are moving so slow. And sure enough, the flight attendant looks at me and said, hey, I've been to that church. That's a nice shirt. Lucky I didn't run my mouth and say something. Right? It would have revealed the cracks in my heart. While we aren't always wearing those T-shirts, but the fact is, we are. God sees the T-shirt of our heart. You see it, right? Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, man looks at the outward appearances, but God looks at the heart. As we close this morning, I want to say, if we are on this side of history, we can look back on the Israelites and see the mistakes that they made. We can look at King Saul and see the mistakes that he made. In, in history, as we're reading this, and you're telling yourself, if you're telling yourself this morning, I got to work harder, we get, you've missed it. If you think, man, I need to be more humble, I need to be more patient, I need to be more X, Y, and Z, you are missing it. You don't have to try not to be Saul in this life. Don't miss this one. You don't have to try not to be Saul. You don't have to try to be a better king of your life because there is a better king. There is a better Saul. It is not your job to try to be a better king, right? We, on this side of history, can look to the coming king, right? Not just, not just the next historical king who is David, but we can look at the one whose, whose invitation is always available, the one who is always in control, the one who is always humble, the one who is always patient, the one who is always fearless, the one who is always who is capable, the only one capable of occupying the office of prophet, priest, and king. He's a healer. He is a deliverer. He didn't come to offer an imperfect and imperfect impatient sacrifice. He came to give his life as a true human sacrifice. He is our savior. Somebody say his name. Oh man, you guys are with me. In him, in Jesus, you don't have to try to be humble because once you get to the point where you say I'm trying to be humble, guess what? You you got it. You're not. You can't try to be humble. But if you abide in Jesus Christ, his characteristics, his characteristics become yours. You start to want to be like him. You start to be formed by him. Slowly in that crock pot, you become like Jesus. The more we abide in him, the more patient we become. The more we abide in him, the more fearless we become. The more we abide in him, the more we relinquish control of our lives. In Christ, we are all new creation. We are, all in, we are all new. So you don't have to start breaking your back and say, man, I'm not trying to be like Saul. You're really trying to be like Jesus. The kingdom is his and his alone. He is the one that the stories are pointing to. When, God, when, 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 when Saul says, you, your kingdom would have been forever, but we're going to give it to another king whose, king whose kingdom is going to be forever, David's family is the one who's going to walk through. I want you to see that. See that story just unravel from the Old Testament to the New Testament. God is saying, I have somebody in mind who is way better, who's going to do this better, who's going to be way more impatient, who's going to be way more patient. He gives the kingdom. He is fearless. He is our king. He is humble, and he is the loved one who wants to love you. If you're here this morning and, and, and you're trying to understand Christianity, you're trying to understand and, and Jesus and what this is all about, this is all about the King Jesus Christ who comes to satisfy everything that you ever wanted. If you're sitting in a, in a place in life this morning, you're saying, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. I don't know. I've been waiting for so long. I don't know what God is doing in my life. I need you to step in and start abiding in Jesus Christ and watch what he does. I always share this story, and I'll share it again. There were times in my life when I chose, as I closed this morning, there, were, there, were, there was a time in my life when I was, I was, I was this close to committing a murder. Um, a man had killed, a man had made me an orphan. A man had taken my father's life. And for 12 years, all I could think about was how can I get back to Liberia and take this guy's life? And it's going to say, I was not wanting God to do his work. 
But for 18 years, I stood on that God was doing a work in me that I did not see coming. When I was 20 years old, when I was 28 years old, I'm sitting in an office, and, and, and a counselor looks at me and said, what would it look like for you to forgive the man who killed your father? And I almost fell out of my chair. But those years, those years of sitting, God did something in me. If you sat with some pain, if you sat with your being impatient, if you sat, trust me, God is doing something. I was sitting in, in, in this winter when we went off the LLM, I was sitting there praying to God. I said, God, what do you want to do with this life that I have? What do you want to do with this life? I always saw my life as a series of losses. I always saw my life as I, I have lost so much in this life. Both parents gone, lost everything, don't have a childhood picture that I can find. Don't, don't remember my friends are all killed. My, my uncles, my, my cousins, people, people in my neighborhood are all killed. I've lost so much. I lost my home. I lost my culture. I lost my people. I come to a new country, and I don't understand what's going on. God, I, my life is so full of losses. I'm sitting in that chapel. You know, what, you know what occurred to me that morning? God said, you haven't lost a lot. I've actually invested in you. I need you to look at Luke chapter 12, verse 48. He says, to whom what much is given, much will be required. Some of you guys are sitting here, you're thinking, I'm losing so much. God, you're doing something that I can't see right now. God sees you. He knows you. He knows you. He knows where you are. And his timing is the best timing. Would you bow your heads for me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace is sufficient. You oppose the proud and give grace to the humble. Heavenly Father, would you call us to Jesus and remind us of what he does for us? Heavenly Father, would you move in such a way that we can see? Heavenly Father, would you look at us and see our foundations and reassure us that in you we can find freedom? Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord. I love you, Lord. May the words of my mouth, Lord, set in the hearts of the people and and may they move, oh God. May you move through these words. In Jesus' name, amen.